So Dorothy, I wanted to ask you, um, have you always had a visual brain? Probably, yes. Do you remember when you were a young When I was girl? little, I was very observant. And um, in later years, a cousin of my father, who suggested that I take photography as a profession, remembered how observant I was, right? Ah, that's wonderful. I wasn't going to study photography, I wanted to study medicine. Right, it's a very I have different... A, I have a daughter who is a medic, oh. and she says I would have made the worst possible <laughs> <laughs> doctor. So, perhaps photography was the right choice. And Everything <laughs> happens for a reason, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, like kind of some kind of memory that um, is linked, like an early memory you have where there was something aesthetically that really stood out for you that you wanted to capture forever? Or make well, we must remember that my early days, my childhood was of a well-to-do middle-class family on the continent. And uh, although my father had a Leica, I wasn't particularly interested. I was a very bookish youngster. Yeah. And... Um, when I came to England, because Hitler had invaded, and my father had an opportunity to get me into England because he was doing business, he had a textile factory. Ah. So he got me a visa, and at the, in June, 20th of June, 1939, I was put on a train to come to England. and to boarding school to finish my education. I had no English at all. My mother tongue is wow. German. Anyhow, the only way to learn a language is to be just... <laughs> yeah, immersed. <laughs> yes, you have to do it and that's it. And um, photography hadn't really much entered my consciousness, except I hated being photographed. My father had a Leica and he was forever photographing it. I was quite a plump little girl, and I had a very good-looking young um, brother, a year older, who loved being photographed. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, I managed, I went to a wonderful boarding school in Sussex. The last few years from, in the 36, 37, Hitler's influence was there. I come from a Jewish family not religious, but definitely Jewish. And um, what was I to, to do? I managed somehow, I had to apologize to the other kids. Uh, I went to, sc to sc boarding school in Sussex, a place called Ditchling. Recently there was, an, uh, there was a program <coughs> of the quintessentially villages of England, and Ditchling was one of them. Mm -hmm. Virginia Woolf was there and so on. So very idyllic. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I was the first foreigner, and certainly the first Jewish person they ever had, but they were wonderfully good to me. I mean, incredible. For me, who'd come after the trauma that I lived through. Yeah. And fortunately, there was a cousin of my father's who was a doctor, who was in England, and who had been present at my birth. And he was married to a non-Jewish wonderful woman who was an art historian and a Bauhaus photographer. Oh, wow. Now, he was very interested in photography. Unfortunately, his wife couldn't come to England. The Nazis got hold of her, wanted her to deny the Jewish husband, and she wouldn't. She lost her life. Well, anyhow, this one, this cousin of father's knew that my background had completely disappeared. It's probably very difficult for you to realize that your past life is gone. Have to be forgotten. Even the town where I was born has now been renamed. It was uh, Königsberg, which was a very important town. I lived there until I was nine, hence my, my German cultural background. Anyhow, he kept an eye on me. He knew I was pretty vulnerable. And he said, 
I managed for some reason. My my daughter still wonder how I managed to do a school certificate within a year without having had any English. And then sometimes when you're put to the test, you do it. I had to apologize to the other kids uh, for having to work to swat all the time. <laughs> Anyhow, um, I did get my school certificate at 16. And he said to me, you realize you have to earn your living. You can't possibly study medicine because there are no funds. You have to find something which will make you independent, mm -hmm. at least mm -hmm. somewhat. And um, he said, I have watched you for you know a long time, and you're very observant. Um, what about photography? I said, you're photography? I only know that uh, you know my uh, my my dad quite annoyed me because he always wanted to photograph me. <laughs> and he had handed me on the day, that's a very interesting thing, on the day I left, they brought me by train to the station and he was carrying his Leica. He took his Leica off his neck and gave it to me. Oh. He said, this might be useful to you. Now he was realizing what was happening in Europe, you see. Anyhow, that like a, a letter, later I had to sell actually, I couldn't afford to keep it. But how he knew I wasn't interested in photography, that was odd. Still remember that like a. Anyhow, uh, this cousin called Sam said, I'd like to take you to meet a wonderful person that I know who has a studio, she's a photographer. <coughs> was called Germaine Canova. She was half Czech and half French. And she had a very important poetry studio in, in Portman Square. I went to see her and fell in love with her mm -hmm. photography because she was an artist, right? <coughs> and she said to me, well, you're very young. Why don't you come and see what photography is like and what I can teach you. And when this war is over, and it will be soon, you can study medicine. Anyhow, we arranged for me to have, to start with her. I not only loved that, the work she was doing, it was photography as art more than anything else. Mm -hmm. I never, I must tell you the story because it was interesting. A week had gone and the blitz on London had begun. Huh? Extraordinary. She packed up <coughs> and left. And I was again at a loose end. But this cousin said, you know, your brother, my brother was sent here to study because my my family did have connections with England, you see. And he was studying um, textile chemistry at Manchester University, College of Technology. And we knew there was a department, a vocational department of photography. Right? And they accepted me, although I was rather too young, but with my history and so on, okay. So I moved to Manchester. But I still remember the kids in, in Ditchley who came from very well-off diplomats' family, you know. When I said I was going to go to Manchester, they were absolutely appalled. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so when I came to Manchester, I expected terrible things. As it happens, the sun was shining. <laughs> and people of the north have been wonderfully kind and good. And the course was okay. I managed to do it very easily. And in fact, my father had brought me up to care for education. So yeah. I said, is there something, a diploma I can get? And they said, there's only um, city and guilds. Right. But it doesn't take two years, it takes four years. And being me, I decided to take it, and I did, managed it. Um, incidentally, 
what is still worrying me that that photographer, Germain Kotkanova, had photographed extremely important people. And the only time I heard her name was when I had an interview at the Observer. And the woman there said, I remember her work. So I don't know what happened to her because she really did some wonderful work. Mm. In mm -hmm. fact, I must try and remember to see if I can't find out she wouldn't be alive anymore, but her work was important. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, Manchester, I claimed to be a professional photographer. And I must have been good at uh, portraiture because I got a, a prize for my, as I was leaving. And while I was there, um, it was quite enjoyable. I have some work that I did there, which was all right. Obviously, photography was something that I could handle quite well. Um, and you'd never done any... You, you clearly have the eyes of an <laughs> artist. And um, I know in 1971 you founded the Photographer's Gallery. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I sort of feel from that you're kind of one of the pioneers of photography being yes, first recognised as an art. Let me just say that several times people have said I was a founder now, the woman I worked with, Sue Davis, was the founder. Right. Right? Because she got very hurt, and she deserves all the credit. Mm. I stood by her, and, and I was with them from the beginning, right? But she was the founder. So we can say I worked at the Photographer's Gallery from the very beginning, from the day it opened. Mm. Okay? And I stayed for 15 years, and putting my own photography to the side, and dealt with other photographers, which was very good. Oh. They used to say to me, how come you understand so much about it, you see, because I was helping to do mm -hmm. exhibitions, and I founded at the Photographer's Gallery the bookshop, because when we opened, I said to Sue, we must have photography books. And we couldn't get, we couldn't get uh, the publishers, they said, oh, don't know. There's Anyhow. been an at change in attitude, hasn't there, I think, of photography? I had no idea. Yeah. The chap who was my boyfriend became my husband. I was a very good scientist, Dr. Louis Baum. Um, his friends at college used to ask me, Dorothy, what are you studying? I said, photography. And they all looked slightly, you know, down. It wasn't something to be very respectable mm. about. Look how that has changed. Mm. It's become well. I, as I was, I was thinking that you were kind of through help, you know help your work at the photographer's gallery, a pioneer of the idea that photography is an art form. You, well, you have the eyes of an artist. You are an, as much of an artist as the painter or the, the sketcher. Mm. Um, and I was wondering if you feel like today people are finally accepting that photography is an art? Can be, let's put it that way. The yeah. same way as a writing. Yeah. Not everybody who writes is a writer. Yeah, right? yeah. And... Uh, Do you feel you maybe see, it's gone the other way because there's an overload of images today? Do you no, think? I have four grandchildren. One is studying medicine. She's not interested in photography. The other three, uh, one went to Cambridge, did his... English there. Now she's a very good photographer. And the other one is doing law. And they take very good photographs. To me, if people come to me, I, I get asked, will you look at my photographs? Mm -hmm. Somebody, in fact, is going to telephone me. She's from America. And she's seen my work and she wants to come and talk to me. I get, sometimes I get love letters, you know, it's very sweet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, as long as the person who's taken the picture is not just taking it because here I am. You see, I personally don't want digital because for me the fact, when I take the photograph, I have to wait for the film to be developed. By the time I look at the proofs, I'm away and my judgment becomes better, do you know? Yeah. 
I remember talking to the Magnum people who said the same thing. They said, unfortunately, they're working for uh, news newspapers. They haven't got time. But very often, if months or years later they look, I said, that was a much better picture. I had the same. You know. It takes time because you were too close to the subject. And you know it was difficult to take, so you'll go for the one that was yeah. difficult to take. It isn't always the best one. <laughs> So for me, photography has been a fantastic thing, and I'm happy that it's accepted now. But I just would like to tell people, don't just because you can shoot and doesn't cost you very much, mm. try doesn't not just to go on to doing snap, it. Yeah, to because really think I, about it. Don't forget when I was studying photography, and for years after, it was extremely difficult to get the material. And even now, before I actually take the picture, I want to make sure it's worth taking. Every image has to be precious. Yes, yeah. Yes, right. mm. Still, I mean, the world has changed. And as I say, when I see some of the pictures that people have taken, they're very, very good indeed. Mm. Whether it is one good one out of 20 shots, I don't know. For me, and I don't really... I want to see the image show to me, yeah? When you're taking a photograph, um, when you're taking a photograph, do you want the image to capture kind of an, a universal truth that everyone can easily see, or do you want it to be, is it something personal to you that you're trying to do? Absolutely personal, right? Mm -hmm. So you're trying to convey to them what you if felt about them? If I take a picture, because it's wanted, I've been asked to do a portrait, then that person's got to like it. But my private pictures, and for the books, I've got to be pleased with them. Yeah. I'm afraid that's so. That's very selfish, but this is it. <laughs> but you're the one that sees the magic, and it's about people being able to... It's like inviting them into your world. Even now. You know, I'm going to be 90 next year. It's terrible. Wow, are you having a big party? I don't want to be. <laughs> um, even now, when it's not so easy to walk about, once I've got the camera around, and I'll tell you one thing, I carry the camera not just everywhere. If I carry the camera... It's open the lens. I'm going out to take photographs. Today I saw a fantastic picture, but I didn't have my camera. Oh, already. no. <laughs> Never mind. But this is the whole point. Mm -hmm. I go out to photograph, to concentrate on that. And despite my old age, I then can walk. I was taken to Brixton because I was told it was an interesting part of uh, London. Mm -hmm. And we were walking for hours. Pictures are good, actually. And uh, I didn't notice it, so you see. <laughs> oh dear, that's mm. wonderful.